So in the last class, we completed the integrated transformations. In this session, we'll be looking at uh, one from the quality transformations, which is base match. Right, so in match, there are different strategies. So <coughs> we'll look at the base of that so that we'll understand how to work with uh, the mass transformation. And one more thing that we'll be looking at as a part of this transformations is like if you have noticed by now all the layout of the platform transformations are similar all the transformations that are part of your platform when you open them they look alike right and same is the case with the integrated transformations when you open them they have a different layout and similarly all the quality transformations will have a similar layout and the uh, thing is that once you work on this, and I'll also tell you how to work with the quality transformations, how they look alike, and what are the common features across the transformations. So once you understand this base match properly, in future, just in case if you work on any data quality projects, you'll be able to work with the quality transformations. And also, there is a small cheat code that is available uh, in the tool itself, which will actually allow you to go and look at, uh, read the context and look at the next step. Okay, so today we will look at a scenario first and then try to fix, uh, create a solution for that one. So scenario is potential duplicates. So first thing, what is a potential duplicate? All right, so if I have a table like employee number, name, salary, and designation, I think we spoke about this, but yeah. So employee number 1000, name is Samuel, salary and designations are blank. Second one, it says 1000, or Samuel R, it says, R Samuel. Then third one says one thousand manager. Fourth one says manager. So if you see data like this in subsequent rows, then definitely you can go and understand that hey, these are the duplicate records but improperly placed in each and every cell. But now if you go and look at this data, spread across thousands of rows. Let us say first record is this in a table and after 10,000 rows you have this record and after 20,000 rows or 15,000 rows you have this record and after 30,000 rows you have this record then you cannot manually go and search on the data in a table to identify this kind of duplicates. So these kind of duplicates are called potential duplicates and it is the biggest risk for you to identify because uh, the actual deduplication process that happens on a database is when you ask the system to identify duplicates in that one, it will take an image of this record and it will try to compare this image with the remaining records and if it finds an exact duplicate or uh, same image present in the table then it will say it is a duplicate. If it is not present then the system cannot identify them to be the duplicates. So in this scenario the system cannot identify them as the potential uh, the direct duplicates. So these are called the potential duplicates. So now Using the base match transformation, we are trying to do two things. One is first identify what is master and what is a subordinate record. Or in some other database terminology, we call this as driver and passenger records as well. So that we can exclude the subordinates or passengers and push only driver or master record to the target system. Right. Apart from that, if I do some activity like get the data from subordinates and post it into master to create a complete record. All right. So this is something that I can do more for the data, which is I am cleansing the data by looking at the subordinates and trying to fill these cells in this row so that I can provide a best record to this target table.
match record base and best record strategy so these are the two things that we'll be looking at 1000 in all cases will it not point to that uh, the duplicates email ID being the primary key so in our case Adil for your question I am not having employee ID in one particular row but similarly I have the same record present across right this Samuel and this Samuel is correct right so it's a combination it's I'm just giving you a vague example here but uh, if you look at this one so here I'm not passing the employee ID as 1000 right it is an empty so there is a possibility especially when you are trying to combine data from different systems and try to merge them into a single system right there is a possibility that you kind of see this kind of data right so just in case if there is this kind of data and if you want to handle this kind of data the best transformation that we can use is match so let us go ahead and uh, create a job All right, create a job and then data flow df underscore match. Now, if you open this, uh, let us say, let me go back to the source files to see which file has okay, yeah, so there's the one. Okay, so this table has three different records. One is ALFK letter. Let me open that here. So one doesn't have address, one record. And the second one and third one have address. The first one and second one doesn't have the city, but the third row has the city. And again with the phone number. So image of these individual rows are not equal to one another so these are the potential duplicates so if you want to identify or cleanse this kind of data now let me add that flat file which I added ff underscore match source select the inbound directory where your flat files are present go and select the file open it and it's a tab delimited file yes and then skip the row headers as yes because it is your source save and close bring it into your data flow and make it as your source now if we go to this transformations match expand it and you'll see something called as a base match I'll run you through a wizard and then I will get you to the base match transformation there is since this is one of the most important transformation there is a wizard available for you so select the target table or any transformation after which you want to put a base match right click and run on the match wizard right so first thing that we want to understand is like what is the strategy because you know you cannot go and identify by a particular column and tell that this is a duplicate you want to have a strategy on which you want to identify the duplicates right at least one of the columns has the proper information right so and one more thing that with data quality transformations is you get to read the text 
like what exactly this transformation is doing and what is the thing that you need to do in this step. So this is a cheat code I am saying about. So because with the other transformations, uh, look at the strategy of SAP. The other transformations are, you know, they are free of cost or what you can say is you can even activate and work with them on the trial version. But the data quality transformations, they are not free of cost and you will not be able to, you know, work with them. Uh, using the data quality transformations they are like uh, you need to procure a separate license key to uh, you know work on your data quality licenses so sap has given a one more uh, feature or a facility where we can go and look at each and every transformation if you open any quality transformation you will see a text next to it saying that what has to be done right so now you need to select a match strategy and it will also give you a description what is a simple match what is a consumer householding match right so based on the strategy that you want to select you can go and read that so now let us go and select the simple match here click on next and identity sets how many identity sets you want to create so I want to validate my data on the form so these are the different criterias on which you can identify full name address like Okay, the primary key is having some blanks or, you know, uh, the data is not properly posted. But one of the column will have a proper value or that can be a potential column on which you can go and do a search. Right? So these are the different options, email, firm, date, uh, latitude and longitude, address. So I'm just taking firm here and compare using two types of words. One is the field similarity and the second one is word similarity so I'll go with the word similarity and click on next now here firm which field of your source you want to compare with the firm so in my data I have something called as a company name so I'm mapping that to firm click on next and now this is one more step that we are trying to do we are trying to do a group by on the data or put data into different buckets on a particular key column so that you can do a quick search within that bucket and improve the performance right so post code is one column on which we can do a quick search then click on finish so technically these are the four steps that you will be doing but you know if you open this or let me pull this base match for your reference here connect it now open this one right you have three areas in which you will be working one is your input schema second one is your output schema and the third area is input options and output so input will contain the columns on which you will be working which is your company name drag and drop it and then the columns which has the potential duplicate which is address city and uh, the phone number drag and drop them into this one okay multiple selections not allowed you have to go with address then city and then the phone number All right and then the postal code on which you want to do a group by Right, and then in the options you have to go to best practices click on edit options and this is where you perform the same set so you create a set then you create a break group and then you create a group processing right you can achieve that using the same thing using a wizard if you open the math set the same window is open but you know the company name is missing so just get it back here the, the problem is the column name I did not give it uh, properly it is like compound name it should be company name and then get uh, the address column on which you want to work the city column on which you want to work and the phone number column on which you want to work right now we have all the case columns on which we want to work now go to the options and click on 
edit options. All right. So this is the transformation set, group formatting, and then this is on the postal code. And the level match criteria is firm name and click on the form since the previously the column name is not properly matched so just give the company name and if the company name is searched on then you know it will go for the post match processing so initially our responsibility is to identify your potential duplicates just, just click on apply and OK now this is done and load this into a target table and call it as base match. Connect it with your table. Validate this. No errors found. Now go and run your job. All right, it's done. Now you open this data flow, go to the output data set, go and filter out on the record ALFKI. Apply. And now you have three duplicates. And look what system has done to it. So now this is the group number. So every duplicate set, the potential duplicate set system will identify uh, and based on, it depends on the strategy that you are selecting here. And based on that, it will give you a group number for those duplicates. And then the math score between those two columns, like how many cells are filled in that row and how many duplicates are present in that group and which is the master record and which is the subordinate record. All right, so this really helps you to identify the potential duplicate and that is possible with the base match transformation. But now if you go and still look at the data, the data is bad, address has nulls, and then city has null and null here, and phone number has null and null here. So now let us create a best record. Let us go and cleanse this data by creating a best record. So you go to the options and click on best practices and go for edit options. So once the match is done, we have to go and do this activity. So that is called as a post-match processing. So select the post-match processing, do a context menu, uh, click on add and go for best record strategy. So these are again different activities that you can do. You can go and select best record, then this is BR underscore city. Then click on the source field, which is city. And destination field is automatically given by the system. If you want to write some Python scripts to edit this one, you can click on Python script and say edit Python. And you can go and write your value here. So if you want to do some operation, I'm keeping this as no. All right. And this is best record br underscore city and this is for column city now similarly I want to go and do this one best record br underscore address and uh, one second sorry in the city we did this one but yeah I want to show one more thing here that the what is the strategy which means if it is a best record which of this criteria will tell you that it is a best record so in our case if a column is non-blank or if a row is non-blank then it is the best record and strategy is on the city column and posting per destination so from where you want to where post where so from must you want to post to your masters or to your subordinators or masters to subordinators to or to all these things so I want to post it in master so that I can pass the master record to the target 
and post only once per destination keep it as yes apply and similarly go for address keep this as non blank strategy is on the address column posting per destination is masters and this is yes and you can keep this as address this is to address and click on apply and uh, click on add go to best record and this is for phone so we did for city we did for address and this is for phone so go for the strategy and same repeat the same process it is non blank and the strategy column is on phone and the destination is to masters and yes and here select the column click on the drop down and select the column phone and destination is phone just click on apply and okay now you have created a strategy for this three columns address city and phone so that the data if, if there is any data that is found in the subordinates it will be posted to master and the strategy is if that particular cell is non blank then only it is considered to be a best record so click on apply and okay and go back and open the base match go to the output options now these three columns you have done some changes on this right so it is address city and phone right click and uh, delete those three columns there now you check these boxes here address city and phone right so these are the new calculated columns that you will get here now go ahead save your job rerun that right your job is successfully completed now just refresh the data and go and apply the filter for a l f k i apply and ok now you go to this one first thing that you want to notice is on the masters the address is posted right the city is posted and the phone number is also posted right but I see that uh, the columns are misplaced here what is wrong with this Output. Okay, address. Okay, these are not checked. Okay, some wrong options I checked, but this is the output. And if you look at the output, the data is posted from the subordinates to the master and now you can apply a filter saying that where the group uh, rank is master and you know you can apply a filter to that particular record and take those records to the next level now you not only identify the potential duplicates but you also give a best record to the customer so this is a typical scenario of data cleansing where you will identify the potential duplicates, clean the data, process the data, and give it to the customers. So, any question on this uh, base match transformation best record strategy? Package? Yeah, Chandra. Uh, in the data we are getting from source, uh, source data sources, right? From mm -hmm. the, uh, sometimes we will get data from flat files. In flat files, the data is not correct. Like uh, some records having some special characters, mm -hmm. like anything. How do we, we clean those data? 
those records those type of records so basically the special characters are nothing but your system allowed formats right so if you are in sap sap follows udf8 and udf16 right so there is one thing that will allow you to not allowing to cleansing then you have to you know uh, so generally if there are special characters on the data which means they are correct right and the certainly uh, system will not go and generate that data from the system because from whichever the source system you are trying to send that data the source system is allowing those kind of characters so those are like utf8 and utf16 the page codes right code pages so if you want to handle that kind of data and tell the system that they are correct you can go and select them from here these are the code pages that you can go and select but just in case to your question if you have that kind of data and you don't want to handle them then uh, i don't know i haven't come across that kind of scenario where if the special characters are ignored because in all the cases that i worked for these special characters or uh you know even in one of my project in uh, dubai i had to read the data which is in arabic right so the system reads that as an image so system can read anything a special character or whatever it is so if you want to save that on your backend database and your database has to support that then you have to update it with the code pages but to exclude that kind of things uh you know i haven't seen such scenarios like that probably you know you give a match pattern for example let us say if you are working on a particular and let us say it is employee number and it should be emp 1 2 3 4 5 it should be the pattern so instead of that you have emp this kind of this thing then you give a match pattern saying that this is matc hpa ttn and Chandra, can you go on mute, please? Yeah, thank you so much. Match pattern of that particular column. You give the column name EMP NO, right? And then give the pattern name, saying that uh, it is capital X X X, which stands for alphabets, capital alphabets, and numbers. You give this one like this. So, which means that if your incoming data set is of this pattern then it is a valid entry if it is not of this pattern which means the first three characters are correct but instead of having the numbers it is having special characters that the system can throw out that data you can set the set these kind of patterns and if you give this one if the value is equal to you, you generally set this on a flag right flag is equal to or on a flag in the mapping tab you go and put a map a match pattern saying that this is if the value of that one is equal to 1 which means the data is according to this pattern if it is equal to 0 or not equal to 1 then you understand that it is not in the pattern are you answer your question chandra yes thank you Uh, I did not get what were the three columns. Uh, uh, sorry, I did not get what are the three columns are for. Which three columns, Adil? Can you be a bit more specific? Are you talking about the mass transformation? The last three columns that we got. see set level then we just spoke about it all right so let me filter it out to okay left ki okay Right, so there are three additional columns that the system, four additional columns that the system is uh, creating. One is the group number, which we understood this the first group of the first group of potential duplicates. Then the scat. Uh, this is like 
the potential match between those records and this is the group count and which is set level this one this three right this is the count of the duplicate records and this is the master and subordinates is that clear Adil? okay yeah right and you see this one record posted with the right data all right with this we complete the transformation set and next we will go to the management console so this is an administration tool and uh, you know probably in some of the projects we get to work on this and some of the projects we will not get to work or even log into this one so let us start with data services management console so the quick uh, difference between the version 3x and 4x of data services is data services management console is the whole soul administration tool for data services in the version 3.x which is 3.0 and 3.2 but from version 4.x data services management console and central management console CMC both are playing the administration role so we'll be looking at both in this version since we are looking at 4x version alright to log into your data services management console from your data services designer you can click on this data services management console or you can go to tools and you can go to data services management console or the actual navigation is start all programs data services 4.2 and data services management console I repeat the navigation it is start all programs data services 4.2 and data services management console and this management consoles both your data services management console and central management console this opens in the web page and uh, we have seen a bit of it when we are especially using the secure central repository All right so now we'll go by tab by tab here so totally we have six options here one is administrator auto documentation data validation impact and lineage analysis operational dashboards and data quality reports we will get into uh, the others first let us go and look at the administrator as the name says this is the administration tool which the administrators work on 90 percent and uh, some of the senior folks will also work on this tool right it allows you to manage your production environment including your bad job execution remember till now we are executing the jobs here so earlier there was a question from Adil or Chandra I don't remember the name but do we get an option to schedule these jobs right so yeah we get an option to schedule the jobs from the administrator and also if you want to run these jobs and test them from the administrator you can do that uh, from here as well and some of the projects they main they maintain a very strict standard that you know none of the jobs should be run from the local repository but they should be run from the administrator the reason is once you clear the cache and all these things the logs will be lost right all these job logs after some time they will be lost but if you are running it from the data services management console your logs will be there on the system so for that particular reason then some projects when you want to execute any job they want to execute from the administrator so it includes the bad job execution real-time services web services adapter instances and uh, we'll look at that a little later when we talk with uh, talk about the XML data the server groups we will see this one in this central repositories profiler repositories and more so central we have already seen we'll go and look at the next options that are present in the administrator so some of these options that I will skip as I did for the query transformation I just left some options there and then when we spoke about the XML we spoke about that so similar manner I will skip some options here that are related to your XML data and your web services in real-time jobs we'll look at them when we are in the right session so that we will have a complete scenario working on that one so if you are working as an administrator on any projects remember do not create hundreds of local repositories 
on that one because now you saw this this data services management console it took a lot of time to open right and in some projects it will be a fantasy like okay now the company purchased data services and each and everybody should have a data services login right so that is that is some some people think it take it like a privilege that okay my company has sap my company has data services now i should have a login to that though you work on the project or not but do not recommend because i have recently seen that in one of my recent projects uh, do not recommend that option and do not encourage everybody to have a data services access because you know people with a lot of skill trained and uh, certified people they do blunders on the project just imagine about some xyz who has no knowledge on data services just for the sake of privilege he got an access he can go and screw up all the work some others has done right so do not entertain that if you are working as an admin do not entertain anybody to have an access remember the central repository uh, class session that we had we spoke about a multi user instance right so based on that per landscape development quality and production just pre plan how many employees you need for the development how many consultants you need for testing how many consultants you need for code promotion and production support and based on that go ahead and create your local repositories but do not create local repositories for every tom dick and harry okay so because that that will really spoil the performance of your system and some people will never understand it till they face a system crash but this is a practice system that's fine you can go and create this but on your projects never ever do that okay so developer instance the maximum level of the size of the team you know it can be 30 40 you just go and create only 30 40 repositories and add them here but not more than that okay now uh, packed subject so when we created a local repository we registered that in the central management console but we did not do anything on your data services management console so these two management consoles are interrelated and uh, you know that is the reason whatever you do on the central management console that gets reflected on your data services management console and this is where we go and see the list of our local repositories now as of now we are in the status page right so this status page is the first option that you see under the administrator and this talks about the overall status of your landscape when i say landscape the development landscape or the quality landscape or the production landscape that you are working on so this gives me the list of local repositories that are present the real time services if they are set up the adapters if they are set up right on which job server you have set up the adapters and then the profiler repositories now uh, remember what is the name of our profiler repository it is repo_lr7 right so go back to this one and just scroll down so you see the name repo_lr7 and this is our local repository which is in green color which means the health of this local repository is good now there are some repositories with orange color which says that uh, there are some jobs that are running or they did not terminate properly now if you click on the local repository it will give you the list of all the jobs that we have run so far with the system configuration on which job server and what is the start time what is the end time and duration of that job right so this from an admin's perspective when i as an administrator when i log into adil's local repository and see what is happening on this system then i can easily see okay this job is running for more time or these are the jobs that he has executed and all these things right so you can do that from you know you can click on the repository from the status tab and see that or under the status you have something called as a patch and if you expand the patch you will see the same list of repositories and sorry all right go and click on repo_lr7 it will take you to the same page so you can navigate from two different ways one is the first one on the status second one is expand the batch batch has the list of repositories right and you expand the batch 
and go to your repository click on your repository name and you should be able to see the jobs that are executed in your repository now this is the bad job history and the last execution of the jobs so it says last execution of the jobs because the option that I selected to display here is whenever a job is executed in my local repository on all the jobs display the last execution of the job so if you want to display a different criteria let us say a job is uh, you know scheduled for once again let me go and select uh, do I not have this job in my local condition scripts and global variables yes Okay, let me select any of this job and if you want to search the last execution of the job you can do that. When was it last executed and what is the time taken? So if there is a scheduled job and you want to see did it run on every day in the last 60 days, 30 days, 19 days, 50 days, right? You can go and set the number here and let us say I want to see if this job history is like executed in the last 10 days how many times it is executed now this will say like how many times a particular job is executed let us say you are scheduling a job and you want to make sure that it runs five days a week and uh, after some time uh, you see some discrepancy in the data and first thing that you want to check is like the schedule of the job it is running properly or not right so you go to this option, click on the drop down, select the job name and select the option last 10 days of executions and then click on search, right? And all executions, right, let us say it is not specific to job, it is on all the jobs, all the executions from a particular date to this particular date. So let us say you have scheduled some jobs on your repository. Uh, generally we don't do that on the development we generally go and schedule the jobs only on the production but just giving you an example let us say if you schedule the jobs on your repository and uh, you want to go and see uh, if all the jobs ran as per your uh, schedule monitor sheet or something that you maintain uh, which have a schedule list saying that this job should run at this time, this job should run at this time. So if you want to cross check that kind of an activity, what you can do, you can go and select the job and in the last 10 days, 15 days, 30 days, you can go and set this one, uh, giving a start date and an end date uh, from, from and to and you click on execute and say you want to see if this, how many times or how many jobs ran in the schedule or in this time period. You can go and do a quick search on this and it says, okay, there's many jobs failed and see the history preserving job, it failed once. But in all the uh, previous things that we saw, we saw only the past ones. It said only once, right? But now if you go and look at this, it will say how many times a particular job ran. And you will also see first the match transformation ran for nine seconds and the next time it ran for five seconds, right? So seconds is pretty good, but you know sometimes you see the jobs running for hours. So let us say I have a scheduled job which runs for 45 minutes a day and uh, uh, at one time it is taking a longer time. Like uh, if I want to do a comparison of last five executions, so uh, first day it ran for 45 minutes, second day it ran for 15 minutes, uh, sorry one hour 15 minutes and third day and fourth day it ran for 45 minutes. So you want to really go and understand what made that job run for 
a longer period as an administrator because you want to check if that is a system factor or is that a data factor or if your resources are filled up and you are not able to run. So there are multiple ways in which an administrator has to look at this. So this is the first step where we will go and look at the time of it. All right. And if you want to look at the configurations, you can click on there or whatever the configuration that is displayed here and it will tell you that is a system configuration and it will tell you at a data store level what are the configurations that are set to. And you can see the previous job execution trace monitors and errors. So trace will give the same thing that you see here when a job is executed. Uh, the match one is the last one. So this is the trace, right? This window is trace. Put your mouse over that, you'll see the trace and you'll be able to see the same trace here. And then you can go and look at the monitor. And if there is any error, you can look at the error. So whatever you can see from the data services, you can see this, but here it is active and it will say empty error file received, but in data services, unless and until there is an error, it will be grayed out. Now you can go and click on trace and switch to monitor and error or you can directly click on monitor or you can directly click on error. And the next best option which is again an administrator's option is performance monitor. I really cannot just show it to you on one single data flow which ran for a few seconds. It was, that's the reason why I was searching for the job condition scripts and global variables. All right. So now, if you look at this job, which is this one, data transfer, which runs for 15 seconds, which is the maximum that we can get here. So if you click on the performance monitor of that one, it will take you to a data flow level and tell, okay, which data flow took what time. So DF underscore DT is the actual data flow which ran for 11 seconds and the sub data flows ran for 0 seconds. So if in a job you have 10 data flows, you can, it will show you the 10 data flows and its subsequent runtime execution in seconds. And if you want to further drill down, you click on that data flow and it will tell you what are the sub components like which is the source table and what is the time taken to execute the number of records and then uh, in the sub data flow right and in this this sub data flow the sub data flows actually ran for a fraction of second so the actual data flow waited for these sub data flows two sub data flows to complete so that is the reason why you have 11 seconds counted on that actual data flow so when you create a job uh, you know try to create a job reading 10 different tables in 10 different data flows and uh, you know try to run it and go to the data services management console click on the performance monitor and see how much time that each data flow took and uh, if you want to go and point out a data flow that ran for a longer period you can click on the performance monitor and see how did it perform that particular data flow level so it will take you to a data flow level and within the data flow it will take you to the table transformations each and every so let us say one particular transformation so you dig into that and you understand that okay one particular transformation is taking a lot of time now the next step that you need to do is like go and see how you can optimize that let us say this is taking 120 seconds in this data flow and out of which when you are trying to do uh, you know, multiple query transformations and one particular query transformation it is saying that this is taking 80 seconds of that, 120 seconds. Now, the next option as a developer that you need to go and or as an administrator you identify that and tell the developer to go and optimize that particular query transformation, pull out the logic, entire logic from that query transformation and try to put it in multiple queries or do whatever the optimization activity that he can do, which will improve the performance of the job. So generally 120 seconds, 130 seconds will not really count but it goes for 45 minutes, 50 minutes and uh, you know if there is a possibility that you can cut it down so you can do that. So in my previous project with the pharma company uh, where we created some 
global employee consolidation project which actually runs for 45 minutes when we completed the design and we optimized that and it ran for uh, you know 3 minutes 30 seconds that is the optimization that we brought down on the job so each and every every step of it was optimized and uh, you know this is where we went ahead and once initially when you are designing the code you cannot really concentrate on both optimizing and design so once your design is done then you can go and see run the job multiple times and go and see like which exactly is the place where you want to capture those bad data and then Oh, sorry, not the bad data, but the bottlenecks which the system is taking for a longer period to process and then you can go and fine tune that, put more additional number of query transformations or there is too much of logic in a particular data flow, split that into sub data flows, or right, do whatever you can to improve the performance. So in the job status tab, these are the three options, last execution uh, of the job, last 10 days or 20 days or 30 days you can go for any number of days till 90 in this one then all executions from a particular date range and when you get to the bottom list history you can see the trace monitor error and again you can also go and see the performance of the job all right so this is the bad job status tab and the next one is bad job configuration tab So configuration tab allows you to schedule, run the job, look at the schedule. So if I want to run a job, right? So hierarchy flattening, click on execute. Right, the same options that you see in the job execution properties, you can also select the system configuration here. Click on execute. And this job will be executed back in the local repository. You can see the log from here. Right? So this job is done. It is just triggered. Look at the system time. So it is just triggered and it is completed. And these are the records that are processed. And no errors found, so you don't find an error log here. All right, so you can execute the jobs from this window, bad job configuration. You can add a job to a schedule. So if you want to schedule a job, let us say this one, click on Add to Schedule. And you have to give a schedule name saying that uh, general, general description like bad job, daily so giving a detailed description will you know let us understand if this is the daily job weekly job monthly job or job that runs on a fortnight or five days a week right so you can give this one and in case you have to check this one to activate this one in case in future you want to remove this job from the schedule you can uncheck this one and there are two schedulers that are supported. One is data services and BOE scheduler, business objects enterprise scheduler. We will go with data services scheduler. And select the days on which you want the job to be executed. So day of the month or day of a week. So you want Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to run and Saturday, Sunday to be an off. You can set that, set that one. Or if you have a calendar, business calendar saying that okay 13th and 17th of this month are holidays so no job should run you can check all the other days by clicking on them right and just don't check on 13th and 17th you click on all the other days of that month all right or if it is Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and Friday five days a week you can check this one all right again there are two criteria in this one you just want that job to run only once in a day or multiple times a day, right? There are scenarios like, you know, this job should fetch the data from the source and constantly update on the target so that the target will get the appropriate data or right data or the most recent data, what we can say. 
So only once in a day you go and set, set the start time saying that okay you should trigger at 9 a.m. CST or 9 a.m. IST. So CST or IST depends on the server on which or the location on which your server is present. It, it depends straight, it's straight, it connects straight to your server time. So whatever the time that I'm setting, just make sure your server time is proper then you can schedule it. You can switch between a.m. to p.m. So this is one time once in a day multiple times a day you can run a job multiple times a day giving a start time let us say it should start at 9 a.m. and run repeat after every uh, two hours so what you have to do is like start at 9 a.m. and you need to repeat after 120 minutes All right so this is the interval okay so duration of the job, so you should be very particular about the duration of the job. You should give the duration of the job in minutes. So if it is taking 45 minutes to run, then once the job is done, repeat interval is 120 minutes. So you can select the system configuration and all these things and then click on apply. Your job will be added to the schedule with whatever the schedule name that you give. So repeat interval should be less than duration. Uh, just one second, uh, once in a day, and remove the repeat interval. Okay, my bad. Alright, so I think we are good. Apply. Alright, so this job is added to your schedule. It says that this job from this repository and the name of the schedule is this is added to this one. So how do you find it out? So click on the repository I'm just going back to the previous screen. Go to the batch job configurations. And I think this is the job that we added to the schedule. So just go to the schedules and click on the oops, this one. To see the job. Okay, I think I can show it to you in another better place. So if a job is scheduled, you can click on this line. And this is a bit confusing. Yeah. Okay, so this gives you the schedule name. Uh, you can remove that from the schedule, activate or deactivate it. Right? Uh, you can add one more job to the schedule. So you can do all these things in this batch job configuration tab, and uh, you can go to the repository schedules and see the job scheduled at the repository level. So let us say five jobs are scheduled in my repository. You can see all the five jobs listed out here. And there is one more option that you see here is called export execution command. So if you want to utilize the third party schedulers, right? For example, Autosys or uh, there are so many third party schedulers available. So if you want to export your job, so click on export execution command and then give the file name right and with which system configuration you want to export if you want to select any you can give and export job server configurations if you are creating some job servers right you want to export them along with that you can export and just click on export and it will create a file right so export was successful password file is created in this path so it will go and create your export file in the job server so you need to just copy that and give it to the third party scheduling tools so that they can put it in the scheduling tool and run so just for your understanding if it is a third party scheduling tool this is how it works we will export our file names into dot batch or dot All right, so let us say this is the third party scheduler and what you will do, you will expose your jobs and give them as job one, job two 
and job 3 and so on so what they will do they'll try to put that include that in a list in your third party scheduler so once your job 1 is done then automatically it will go and trigger job 2 job 3 and job 4 so this supports your event based triggering so which is not technically possible with your data services tool you can only do a time based scheduling but uh, with the third party tools you can go ahead and create an event based tool event based scheduling so that is one additional option that you have with export execution command all right so this one is repository schedules you can go and look at the all the jobs that are scheduled at this repository level so that is with the batch right so real time leave it we will talk about it when we are talking about the real time jobs and xml data web services leave it sap connections i'll try to show it to you tomorrow or in the next session then adapters uh, real-time jobs server groups we'll talk about it central we spoke about it profiler we'll look into it object promotion management and again management have many sub options here we'll talk about this and job execution history you can see it from the batch or at the repository level you can see the entire repository or entire landscape level execution history in this option Achandra, if your question is done can you go on mute Yeah, so these are detailed enough, uh, Adil, which says is that what exactly happened, and then you go and combination with your log, trace, and monitor, you'll see like what exactly happening at each and every stage, how many records are extracted, and then what happened, and then uh, what is the time taken for that, and then it, it went to the next data flow. So this, you know, initially it just looks like a small page, but now once you start working on this on multiple scenarios try to read the logs trays and try to understand it then it will give you a lot of information and added to that you know the performance optimization or performance monitor whatever this this option that we searched okay October, November, and December. Right, this performance op op uh, monitor, this will take into a detail level, which will give us a clear picture on what is happening between the transformations and tables as well. So yeah, that should be enough for us to dig in details to the job. Because ultimately you will dig down to a particular transformation or a particular data flow which is causing the bottleneck and then you try to fine tune it, right? So that should be enough. All right, guys. So tomorrow we'll have a class and uh, see you guys in tomorrow's session. Till then, take care and have a good time. Bye.